Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's The Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and on this day in 1888, the National Geographic Society was created in Washington, D.C. for the, and I quote, increase and diffusion of geographic knowledge. So, to celebrate, today, let's increase and diffuse all the ways to make more money. Leading us into the wilds of the market, we welcome the Doc with the Stock, Doc G. Plus, the adventurous we got to stay at home long enough to write our show, Paulette Perhatch. And finally, a man who's always guiding you through the path to the punchline, somewhere right up over this hill, from LenPenzo.com, it's Jane Goodall. Nah, she's with a different group of apes. Hopefully that group knows how to use their thumbs. It's just Len Penzo. But that's not all. Then we'll trek toward my trivia question. And now a guy who's the safari leader on the way to a pack of gains. It's Joe Salci. Hi. Man, Doug, I thought you said a pack of games, like board games. I was like, hell yeah, we're on our way to a pack of games. And then I realized you said gains, and that games. too. That's good. How are and you're you, like, man? I haven't been to a gym in years. <laughs> <laughs> it, it feels like it's just getting over this cold. Hey, everybody, welcome to Friday. We're going to have some fun, so sit back and relax. Grab your favorite beverage and join us as we talk about making more money, as Doug uh, succinctly said. Let's start off this tour by introducing you all of the players in this conversation. Let's go deep under Los Angeles, where in his bunker, Mr. Lynn Penzo is is waiting how are you my friend i'm wet and soggy that's how i am my friend wet and soggy does that mean hey that's this side hustle doug don't judge yes. jeez no kink shaming on this show <laughs> right buy the url len len's gonna put us on mute right now and buy that url you know i yeah. had a funny joke but i'm not gonna follow that uh, paulette so i'm just let's move on <laughs> probably well when len says funny joke we already know that means it probably wasn't that great however i wasn't gonna say it i support you len but <laughs> and that other voice you're hearing, uh, the woman behind the F off fund herself, the woman who powers powerhouse writers, Paulette Perhatch is here. Hi, thanks for having me. Just How had a piece you? of the New York Times, feeling good. That Got is the good. Got back the Key West Literary Seminar. Yeah, running around, making stuff happen. You and I were talking about that drive just before you took it out to Key West. Is that the world's best drive? It is. It's pretty long to Gainesville. It's still eight hours. So, uh, yeah, it's kind of a haul. But I listened to um, I listened to The Richest Man in Babylon yesterday, finally, it's the wow. whole time. It was like story time. Yeah, I loved it. So Paulette has a parable or two in her right I now. I know. I was like, oh, it sounds so easy when you say it like that. And the guy from our sister show, Earn and Invest, Mr. Doc G himself, Jordan Grubb, is here. How are you, Doc? I'm doing well. I guess according to Doug, I'm the doc with stock, but I haven't been feeling those gains this year. So maybe that's something we can talk about. We got a little gains this year. I think you're still stuck in 2022, big guy. Yeah, yeah, my brain is still back there. That's right. Well, well it's easy you to... still own the shock. <laughs> <laughs> and it's easy to make that mistake when you look at how much money you're still down to, right? For people that are new to this show, they might not know about Earn and Invest. So tell everybody what you do there because you have a lot of dis discussions like we're having today. So in Earn and Invest, we have the next level discussions on financial topics, not how you necessarily get to strong finances, although that's very important to us, but also what you do next. And so we do definitely have these kind of next level conversations about some of those deeper topics about what, e what money means in our lives and what we should be doing with it. Oh, Paulette, I was thinking there's a serious discussion you and I have to have. Is it about your body odor? The email? Did you get the email? I did, I did, I did not. I did not. Maybe I should, oh, though, on that. Okay. No, I was mail. just before we went to that break, I thought you were saying check my junk. I was like, what? <laughs> More than, more than body order. Wow. That's, that's not not good. Yeah. No, I've had to have that conversation before. Paul, look how I'm embarrassed Paul is. Yeah, I can't. Wow. We've, we've crossed Everybody the line. Everybody needs to watch the YouTube me. version of this. But you didn't I know that I had a line. There it was. I was glad she said male at the end of it. 
Check him out, John. <laughs> Paul, on that note, where do we go from here? Paul, let's hear. Let's hear. Only Doug's here. Do you have an HR department, Joe? <laughs> do you, do you about, have an HR department? <laughs> we're, we're about not. to find out. <laughs> <laughs> it's called the internet. <laughs> Our piece today comes to us from our friend Nick Majuli. Nick uh, has a great blog called Of Dollars and Data, and he was on the show recently uh, talking about lessons from his new book. We're not talking about his book today. We'll link to it in our show notes for people who want to hear more from Nick. But Nick's uh, piece to kick off 2023 is called It's Time to Work. And I thought this is a great, great discussion for today because he is a whole whole philosophy on maybe how you should manage your money. And this whole discussion, Mr. Penzo, starts off around this idea of alpha. He says that too many people spend too much time chasing alpha. So can you define for our stacker community what that means? What does it mean to chase alpha? Well, alpha is, I, I mean, people use it some more in the generic sense. I think alpha meaning returns. I, I mean, technically it's, uh, it's excess returns. It's returns over and above what you would might normally expect. But I think I think he's kind of using it as it just in the terms of of returns, your stock market returns on your investment. So uh, I, I don't know. Do you agree with that, Joe? That's what it seemed like to me. I do. I do. I think he's using it a little incorrectly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Slightly. I mean, Nick knows better. Right. I mean, Nick knows what alpha is, but I think he's doing that on purpose, saying we chase returns. Yeah. And that's fine. I, I you know, because I think most people out there, they. I think most people out there use that term in the incorrect sense. I mean, it's still, it gets the point across. People are talking about returns, but in, in really it's supposed to be your excess returns over and above what you would normally expect. Not to be, uh, the other term that you might hear is beta, which is risk, actually. It's, it's the amount of risk uh, that you're willing to take. So, um, and then it gets even more out there. There's there's gamma, which I now I'm getting way out over my skis, so, but there's such gamma as well. <laughs> That's your lesson in, in, the, uh, in the Greek alphabet right now. So, by the way, you know, I'm, I'm going to be making a movie about the Greek alphabet soon. Did you know? Oh, yeah, really? it's going to be a yeah, it's going to be a sci fi film. <laughs> and uh, hold on. Wait, <laughs> hold on. There he is. Thank you. He's here all Thank week, folks. Much. Tip your weight, Steph. We do that, Paulette, though. I mean, think about this. When you have discussions with your friends, you're not, you're not talking about, oh, so I took my money, I put it in this index fund, it's boring as hell. No, we're all talking about, you see the stock market, I did this thing, I invested in this cool thing, and it went up a lot, or maybe it went down a lot. We usually don't tell those stories. But why are we so addicted to this idea of excess returns, like Nick says we are? Because I think it, it's... It's exciting. You know, big sweeping changes are exciting. And as I learned from the richest man in Babylon, it's very risky, but it's exciting. It is like, especially for people with ADHD, it's like, it's supposed to be boring and boring does not make a good story. The things we talk about are the things that are exciting. And those are the things that make big, fast returns. It's not going to be like, did you know I put a hundred dollars a week away for the past 50 years and it really grew well. And like, that's not a good story. It's like good for you, but like not something you want to talk to your friends about. So, um, yeah, I think that's why, but that's not what I do. You know, you talk about ADHD while you're, while you're talking about this. And, and obviously then I start thinking about your brain and I think it, maybe it's, it's Paulette while you're talking, it tickles the same part of the brain as when you walk into a casino, right? I oh, walk yeah. into a casino, I'm like, man, I'm going to hit it rich, right? We see the, the, uh, a couple weeks ago, the, the lotto hits $1.3 billion. Did you guys all play? Did you play? You didn't. Play. Yeah, I, I, I live in Maine, Joe. So I. Oh, I play. <laughs> oh hey. May or may not well, be that single person who won. Yeah. It. When I was twelve, my family won five hundred lottery tickets, and that was the best lesson I could have ever gotten. Mm -hmm. I watched them go through every single one. That's a, almost a ticket a week for ten years, and uh, we won like twelve dollars. And I have never played the lottery. Uh, 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 500 more chances and one twelve bucks. That's a story yeah. on its own right there. Yeah. <laughs> Holy cow. Uh, uh, Doc, so we play, this, we play this lottery game. Nick says that that's not what we should be doing. He says this isn't a great use of time. 
Yeah, I mean, what we're talking about is speculation, right? So this idea that we like gambling, we like the lottery, we like that little endorphin hit when we put it on the line, and that's exactly what Seeking Alpha is doing, right? We know that there's some basic things we can do to make market returns, and anything above and beyond that, most of the time ends up being some type of speculation or not, and that's why when you look at it long term, most people can't consistently get excess alpha. It's just really hard to do that. Interestingly enough, I mean, you know, you can go the other way and say, well, so what we're doing is we're trying to be reactionary, right? We're trying to read the market and react in such a way in order to produce alpha. But in some ways, I think Nick is saying the same thing as to be reactionary and all of a sudden read the market right and start working really hard. And to me, I think both arguments are just as silly. Wait a minute. It seems to me that he's saying you should be indexing. I mean, this feels like indexing all over it. Well, he is saying you should be indexing, but what he's really saying is that you should be reactionary, right? So what he's saying is, look, the market isn't what we thought the market was going to be, so let's be reactionary and double down on work. I would argue that a good financial plan isn't reactionary at all. In fact, that's why you write out a financial plan. You shouldn't say, oh, the market's down, I need to work harder. You should have written out a financial plan a long time ago, and if you're at the beginning of your career, you're going to be working hard because that's a great time to be putting money in the market. And if you're older and you're retired, you should hopefully have put together a nice financial plan so you don't have to work harder or go back and double down on work. Either way, you're being reactionary. Yes, he's talking about putting your money in index funds, but now he's talking about being reactionary on how much you on the how much you work side. Okay, and but, but to me, I think that's I think that's who well, to catch everybody up on what you're talking about, he says that if you're going to put your time anywhere between the two, stop putting so much time on trying to beat the market and spend that same amount of time on work because you're going to make money on work. It's going to be consistent income, almost like what Paulette's saying, right? Where she's like, hey, I put money consistently in the market and it made money. So boring. But, you know, it's a guaranteed paycheck. What's wrong with that? Nothing's wrong with that. What's wrong is changing your plan based on what's happening in the market in the current day. And that's what I think he's making this argument that, hey, the market's down. Let's this is he'll say he even says 2023. It's now is the time to really work. And I'm saying, well, no, I mean, basically, you should have a financial plan and it shouldn't change based on the market. I mean, isn't that the whole point of having a nice, stable financial plan is that you actually have it written out. You have a plan for the future. Why are we being reactionary? Why are we letting the market decide for us? If we've planned correctly, the market could go up, the market could go down. We hopefully have a decent financial plan that should carry us through both extremes. Yeah, I mean, that's sugar daddies there. Mark it up, mark it down. Yeah, I mean, this is it's 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 hustle culture. I mean, basically, this is like the crypto bro hustle culture thing. It's like, you know, let's hustle it out. Let's do it. Well, it's maybe if you actually have a really good financial plan, you don't have to worry about working harder in 2023. You should just stick with your plan. Len, were there ever times for you where when the market went down a bunch where you, you know, did the thing they say in internet circles and back the truck up and double down on your 401k savings or put a bunch more money in? Mr. Risk averse me? No, I've never, I, I haven't done that, Joe. Um, I have taken flyers. I have done that search for alpha. Um, uh, maybe what I'm speculating, uh, but I never, I never put in more than I can afford to lose. I, I Anything I put in where I'm trying to hit a home run, uh, it's very small amount of money. If I'm trying to get a 10 bagger or something like that, you know, because, because you know, with risk, with reward, it comes risk. And, and I, a lot of people figure, oh, well, you know, there's a chance for a 200% return. So there, you know, that's, there's no risk involved, but no, if there's something with like a chance for 200 or 300 or 400% right. return, there's also an equally as good a chance that you're going to, you're going to bust. You, you could lose every last penny of it. So, um, and, and I just want to take the opportunity here now that I've, I've, looked a little closer here at uh, is it Nick, right? Nick's uh, article. Yeah. He does, he does use alpha correctly in, 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 in this by, he talks about using your time to eke out additional gains. Additional above, gains. Additional, uh, he does use that term there. Yeah. So uh, my apologies. I am, um, I should read a little more carefully.
Can I bring up something that he said that sounded almost the opposite of what I've heard before? He said, most people, most rich people don't get rich on their investments. They get rich on their salaries. And I was like, that is literally the opposite of what I've usually heard that, you know, you can't, I think it's like, you can't just work your way toward wealth. You do have to invest in wealth as well. But it was just interesting to hear that. And I'm like, gosh, it's almost exactly the opposite of what you usually hear. It is. That's funny that you say that, but 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 it, it doesn't make it not true. Uh, mm. But there is Paulette a one-two punch, isn't there? There's I got to earn the money, but then there's got to be that gap so that mm -hmm. I keep a bunch of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it's like yeah. If you if you start with very little, like you're not with this, you know, this kind of investing. I don't know, but there, then there is the like you know the millionaire next door just kind of chugging along little by little investors, and that is how a lot of people build wealth on pretty humble incomes. I think he's pointing, pointing though. I think he's pointing towards the fact that it, it, depending on where you are in your career, what's mm -hmm. more important when you're first starting out savings, the bulk of your he's when he's speaking net worth, the bulk of that is coming from what you're putting in. It's not coming from uh, it's not coming from your returns on your investment. So, I mean, you're just starting out. If you can put in 15% of your paycheck, um, you're going to, that's going to boost your net worth early on. But then down the road, 20, 30 years, once you've totally built a lot of those savings, now those 10, 20% returns or 7% or even 5% makes a huge difference and it overwhelms the amount you're actually putting in. So I think that's where he's focusing. He's saying, hey, when you're just mm -hmm. starting out, don't worry about the return so much. Worry about save the money. Shoveling. In, in, yeah, shovel. shovel that money in, get that going. <laughs> then you can worry more, returns are more important later on in your career, which also means it's, that's why you shouldn't worry about risk so much early on. That was my problem when I was first mm. starting out. I, I, I did not take enough risks when I was younger and I had plenty of time to recover from mistakes. That, mm. I, I, I do regret that. That's Mr. Risk Averse that really bit me back in my younger years. You feel the same way, Doc G? Oh, yeah. I mean, front loading the sacrifice is a really good way to create wealth. Uh, the amount of money you earn at the beginning of your career can help you sail through the end of your career. I mean, when I first started working, the amount of money I could make from a paycheck um, far outdistanced what my investments made. But now in my 40s, my investments by far make more than I do working, which is kind of laughable, right? Because I realize I go in a, if I go work really hard for the next year or two, I'm going to make money, but it actually doesn't compare to what my investments make. And if I don't take Nick's advice and instead wait out the fact that I still have many, many years of investing left. As long as I manage what I have already invested, I don't need to go out and work like a madman because it's 2023 and the market's down. I can wait for the market to come back up. Which is a powerful thing. Do you, do you though feel like Len does about something else, which is you didn't take enough risk when you were young? No, I took lots of risk. I was the exact opposite. I put my money. In fact, I took too much risk. You know, in 2002, the the dot com bubble, I lost tons and tons of money. Uh, but I was always very aggressive with my investments. I was always, in fact, too aggressive at some point, you know, when I learned that there were such things as index funds and I could make a lot of money with those and be aggressive in my asset allocation, meaning put more money into stocks as opposed to bonds or in cash when I was aggressive with my asset allocation, but not nearly as aggressive with my actual stocks that I bought. That was when I really started seeing the gains. Doc G in 2002 is going, you mean it doesn't all have to go into pets.com? What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> was, yes, I was highly, highly tech leveraged and I bid it. No question about it. Highly pets.com leveraged. <laughs> Paula, how about you early on? Uh, do you wish you were more aggressive? <laughs> maybe maybe less aggressive on shopping? I mean, um, I was not thinking about this stuff at all. I am very thankful that my college job started us a retirement fund and got me started investing in my retirement fund in college. And I saved like... I think like $2,000 in college in my retirement fund, but it just got me started right back in the day. And then it became a habit. Um, but I definitely remember picking those stocks, just like a uh, like literal eeny, meeny, miny, mo, no idea. A huge list of stocks just like maybe 
no idea. So was I aggressive? Who knows? Was I no conservative? Idea. No idea. A whole lot was of eating, a, a little bit, of, a little bit here, a little bit there. That's what I did. Paula, I diversified. Four, hmm? Did you have a four hundred one k? That's a very good question, Len. Oh, you don't save it for the trivia. Um, well, no, I, I was just saying because you know, back when I started, four hundred one ks were weren't quite as um, they were a little more to me complicated. They had more um, mm -hmm. funds that weren't preset. I mean, now at the, near the end of my career, I noticed they have all these preset uh, uh, funds based on your age. So you could, you That's know, great. They, the, where I was at is called like the the twenty. 20 fund, the 2030 fund, the 2040 fund based on when your retirement date was. And they would, they would set the level of risk based on that. And, you know, for people who aren't as sophisticated, you could put your money in. Yeah. I mean, all through my twenties, I just remember getting an entire big list of funds and being like, what percentage do you want to allocate in each one? And just yeah, no idea. Overwhelming. Joe, yeah. Yeah. Joe, if I remember right, you and OG are not huge fans of target date funds, but are they uh, better than nothing? Oh, absolutely. Better than nothing. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't use a target a fund, but, but, and I also think to, to lend to your point early on, you don't really need one. If Paulette would, would just pick an aggressive mutual fund, you've got, you know, a hundred, yeah. 200, 300, 400 stocks. What's the chance they're all going to go under. So just choose mm. something really aggressive when you're in your twenties and then get more conservative as you go. In fact, so Nick says as he gets older, then as he gets older and his portfolio, like doc G was saying, makes more money than he makes working that's when you really need to start parsing out what fun you have. Get away from just having the aggressive one and now go with a more balanced approach. Uh, Paul, that was talking about in the early days, she was just throwing darts because she wasn't even sure. And, and I think that's really common. I remember mm -hmm, feeling sure. similar to that early on. How, what should we look for in, if, if we're looking at our 401k options that are presented to us, are there key phrases we can look at that say, this is more aggressive? If we just think I'm yes. young enough, I should be super aggressive, mm -hmm. but I don't know which one's aggressive. Is there some phrase we can look for to just throw the dart yes. at that one? Yeah, they will separate them out by size of company, large company, mid company, small company, international company. They will separate them out that way. You know, move more toward the, the, the medium and the small companies when you're young. I mean, go, go, with, go with those much, much more. I just want to make the point, too, that a lot of times when we're talking about aggressiveness, we're actually talking about asset allocation and not the specific funds within the asset. So, again, a lot of young people aren't even in the stock market, and a lot of people are overly in the bond market or in the cash market and are not in equities at all. So, well, how many part times, of that, how many times, Doc G, have we heard that phrase where people go, I saved it in my 401k, but I never invested it? Yeah, yeah. And that's a big, yeah. so, so part of being aggressive, when we're talking about being aggressive, especially for a young person, we're talking equities, not necessarily always the specific ones, although you can get into that too. But it's just equities. We want them in the equities market to start with. It would be so much better if they just named them like aggressive funds, like the Hulk Hogan fund. <laughs> 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 then you'd know. There'd be yeah. no. No gray area. The Hulk Hogan fun. <laughs> the Widowmaker. The Pile Driver. The Mr. <laughs> T fun. I pity the food on Vesemi. That was, that was and, bad. And, <laughs> one other more serious point, too, is if you're actually going to follow Nick's advice and double down on work right now, I don't care where you are. You should probably be an aggressive equities because if you're still working and you still have income, you don't have to be as careful in a sense with your bond and cash allocations right and remember we talk aggressive uh, stackers we're not talking about buying one stock like i was joking with doc g about pets.com i'm talking about buying an aggressive mutual fund which is going to have yeah. 300 400 companies inside of it that's a great mitigated risk way to get into more aggressive things don't go buy one stock len you you were you were about to mention another way that companies will change the uh will show you and give you clues about how risky things are well i was just gonna say you know there's other there's other funds that are out there that are, kind of make things a little simpler for people who are who you know there's like value funds and then there's growth funds right yeah where the growth funds tend to be more aggressive than the value funds yeah. whatever your level of risk appetite is you know you might want to go 
go into growth if you really think, you know, you're younger and you want to you know get out there. And if you're a little more conservative, you want a value fund. I love that, Len. Uh, Doug, to your point, if you just know those two things, the size of the companies, right, knowing that smaller equals more aggressive. And then second, value versus growth. Value means the manager's looking for discounts. They're they're going either dumpster diving or thrift store shopping or whatever analogy you want to you want to use where they're finding these values that cost them very little those stocks tend to perform much more on an even keel doesn't mean they're always going to make money but much more of an even keel than a growth manager because a growth manager isn't looking for deals they're wondering if that same company is going to shoot the moon if it's going to do phenomenal things and go crazy and so, so they're more likely to take on debt they're more likely to take on a company that might expand too fast but when they hit it they're going to hit it big the funny thing is over long periods of time growth and value historically have gotten to about the same place growth though if you hit it at the right time it's a little more casino if you hit it at the right time you could make a lot more money so more aggressive investors and frankly when you're younger what i like about growth is heck when you're young if it goes down that's kick ass i mean we don't think about it that way but if it goes down and i'm doing what nick says and i'm shoveling money in I'm shoveling more money into every share of that thing. So a growth fund is more likely to go up and down and up and down more often. So I would tend to want a growth fund more than a more than a value fund because I'm going to see a lot of those dips that allow me to get more money in there um, uh, throughout time, knowing that, you know, when I get to the point that my money's worth more than than uh, my my income, then I'm going to have a whole different game that I'm playing. You know, we we touched on this, I think it was Doc, maybe three, four minutes ago, but the notion that people are putting money into their 401k because they've elected a certain percentage through their employer, but don't realize that it's not going anywhere. It's just getting put in into a, like a holding place, right? And it's not actually getting invested. That just happened to the Fin turn. You know, he's got another side gig, Joe, that you probably don't know about that actually has a 401k and health health benefits and all of that. It's an actually side pays. gig. Something that pays. Just, I mean, it's a little thing he does on a lark off to the side. But he he, he, he did that for like the first three months. He was putting money into the 401k and had no idea that he needed to pick funds. No and I see that all the time on like Instagram videos and TikTok that young yeah. people are just like, oh, just realized, you know, like, oh, my God. And, and for reduction, we're, we're failing people who are, you know, like we're failing people who are trying to use the system. If, pe if that many people are and, you know, someone that close to the investing industry can't figure it out, it's like, blah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and to be reductionalist about it, for the people who are really confused about these things, still very few things beat an S&P 500 index. So you can get into small cap, large cap, you can get into growth and value, but over 10, 20, 30 years, very few things consistently long-term beat an S&P 500 index. So it's a very easy way to start if all of this confuses you. I just said the good thing about the the people who have, you know, maybe they mistakenly just left their stuff in the 401k and, and they didn't put in any funds. You know, if as long as they had a company match, at least they were earning 100 percent on whatever the company match was. So it's not a total, yeah. you know, mess up. If you, if the company yeah. matched three or five percent, hey, you got 100 percent return on that, that three or that five is, percent. That is the good news, Len. The bad news, Doc, reductionalist is not a word. <laughs> you got the idea either you way. You used it twice. <laughs> I'm calling that shit out every time. <laughs> How reductionalist well, <laughs> of you. <laughs> Three times. Coming up in the second half of the show, now that we talked about what the problem is that we're chasing alpha, maybe we want to work more. However, uh, we didn't dig into what Doc G talked about, which is this hustle culture. Uh, how do we do this better? We talked about picking investments but if nick is right then we just need to get the shovel out what does that mean for our game plan how should our game plan change and what does it mean also about the nature of work and maybe making more money at work that's what we're going to do in the second half of this discussion but before we get there on this show starting last week we kicked off 2023 with our trivia game and in week number one Len Penzo 
got off to a nice start with the definition of a word that we said a few uh, thousand times. And if we were on terrestrial radio, we would have been kicked off because of, because of that word. This week, it's going to be a lot more tame. Uh, well, it's going to be exciting, of course, because we've got Paulette, Len, and uh, Doc G playing as OG today. Okay. Uh, going head to head to see who wins this year's year long trivia contest. Doug provides the question. They'll all deliberate and then we'll see who this week's winner is. Doug, what's our question, man? Well, stackers, I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and today we're celebrating the birth of National Geographic. Joe's mom has stacks of these things all over the basement going back to 1966. Want to see more on the moon landing? She's got it. In fact, National Geographic has truly been involved with some of the biggest moments in human history. That famous 23-hour heart transplant in the 80s? National Geographic captured it. The last roll of Kodachrome film? given to a National Geographic expedition to film, among other things, a nomadic tribe in India whose nomadic ways were coming to an end. But today's question is about a big money-making franchise created in response to a National Geographic quiz. Where in the world is Carmen San Diego? That's not the question. Wait for it. <laughs> this hit award-winning show was created because what percentage of Americans couldn't show where either the Soviet Union or the Pacific Ocean were located on the map? I'll be back with the answer right after I go look it up myself. I mean, Pacific? <laughs> Pacific Ocean? I mean, I've heard of the Pacific Oceans, but <laughs> Pacific? Really? <laughs> All right. I'm going to go look it up. All right, Doug. My guess for this number is horrifyingly high. (laughs) (laughs) Obviously, at the time Carmen San Diego was created, uh, the Soviet Union was still a thing. So that's just how old that award-winning franchise is. And I don't know about you guys, but I like Carmen San Diego. Man, we had we had uh, uh, Carmen San Diego games. I played with my kids. Like that was all Mm -hmm. fun stuff, man. But what percentage of people could not find the Soviet Union and Pacific Ocean? on a map when asked it's specific ocean (laughs) (laughs) uh going first len you're in the lead so you have uh, vaulted to the top of this shindig what uh what percentage of people oh gosh i would think like paulette said it's probably alarmingly high but gosh the pacific ocean come on i mean that's the part that's kind of holding me back just a teeny it's bit it's literally the, the biggest thing on I the globe i know but and the, and the soviet union was like the biggest country right so <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, it's not bulgaria right. uh, so so that's the part that's kind of making me think maybe it's not as high but it's got to be high so it's obviously got to be over 50 percent, i would think i don't know i'm gonna say there's a little gamesmanship here i gotta try and pick a number it's uh gives me some chance without being i'm gonna say uh, 72 percent 72 percent of people couldn't pick them both Doc G, you're playing on behalf of OG. Uh, you break the tie going first because you're last year's winner. Believe it or not, you represent the winner. People that don't know, people don't know Doc G in the show don't know that Doc G's about to say 280 percent of people. <laughs> I, I like the beginning. I like the beginning of the year because I can't really ruin anyone's chances yet. So, what do you think, Doc? So I I always come up with my own answer before I hear what anyone else says. And my own answer before I heard what anyone else says was 67%, which kind of puts me in a conundrum because that's way too close to Len. So now I got to figure out, do I really think it's higher or lower than 72? I think he's pretty darn close. I'm going to say you said 71, right, Len? So if, if Len says 70, 72, yeah, I'm going to say 70. Yeah, I'm going to say 71 then, because I think it's slightly lower, but I think he's right on. I, I think he's close. Oh, man, Paulette, there's an opportunity here. I know. I got bad news, Len. Are you going to sandwich me, sandwich me, Paulette? I'm going to Chelsea Brennan you hard. <laughs> I'm going to do 73%. Yeah. 73%. Heartless. Heartless. That Can't is, find that's, them both. That's, not a, that's beyond Chelsea Brennan. That's sandwiching. That's I've, I've got it on both ends. <laughs> So and that's and that's the way Len Penzo talking with sandwich dot com. Grab the there should be a rule. Grab the there should be a rule. If you're if you're sandwiched and you're correct, you get two. You get double the points. 
Oh, how about I'll, that? I would go with that. I got to tell you, we did have a rules change uh, uh, that uh, stacker Nathan sent to me. Nathan been listening for a long time. By the way, thanks for this, Nathan. Nathan said that he doesn't like the gamesmanship that's involved, that you three should each like put it on a piece of paper and show us at the same time. And 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 I wrote back to Nathan, like, you don't understand why we play this game. <laughs> like, we don't, I, don't care, I don't care about the trivia. I want to watch. What? I want to watch Len get sandwiched. That's my goal. <laughs> then go to wetandsoggysandwich.com, get your credit card, and you too can watch Hot Len Penzo being wet and soggy sandwiched. What was that old Peter Sellers movie, Doug, where he would walk around saying, I like to watch? And he was talking about TV, but everybody thought he was kinky. <laughs> and, I have no idea, Joe. And he's, and, and he's, he's, I wouldn't know. He's the guard. He's the gardener. Um, oh, did you get this at a special oh, rental uh, store, video rental store? Joe? No, this yeah. is a classic it movie from actually, the '70s. It, it is a it classic was like late movie. Late '70s. Oh, I'm sorry. That was from before I was born. No, so I, I know. know. And, and, oh, Paulette, you know what though? You would love this movie. It's a super movie. Okay. I want to say it was a pretty good play <laughs> as well. Uh, yeah. Oh, gosh. Uh, it was, and it, I think it won some Oscars. You, if only you we had a way to look this up. Yeah, you encouraged me to watch. Nobody watch. Google I like to watch. I don't <laughs> tell you that much. <laughs> <laughs> The movie's called Being There. Being, being there. there. I was going to say in unbearable lightness of being. But. Yes, uh, Being There. With a, the movie has a great message. Highly recommended. But he walked around saying, I like to watch. And he was talking about TV, but everybody thought he was <laughs> being a little bit different than that. All right. Uh, on that note, we've got, uh, what, 71 for Doc G, 72 for Len, 73 for Paulette. We'll you see who's right. Terrible. <laughs> <laughs> see who's right in just a second, but I'm fairly certain. And Len's not keeping the lead. We'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Len, you kicked this thing off. You said there's got to be a little gamesmanship, but I think that kind of went against you, dude. Yeah, that I, you're right. I should have I, I should have tried not to be so correct. Um, yeah, I would like to I would like to know if the judges, though, I, my proposal for the for the future here, any sandwiching, if you're correct in your the sandwiched person is correct should get two points i think we take that under advisement <laughs> and uh, we will regroup i'll, I'll let everybody it. know next week we'll take it to the council then we will yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, i'm definitely part of the anti-sandwich group because i'll never get it exactly correct whether someone sandwiches me or not so well do you think 71 you got everything below there doc g feeling good no, not really. I usually I usually don't win, so it doesn't, it doesn't make a difference. Just the fact that I picked it is is a negative, you know, factor. I usually and, lose. <laughs> well, then I think the only question left is, Paula, do you feel as confident in your win as uh, Doc G feels in your win? <laughs> I feel as confident in the terrible geographic skills of Americans. Uh, so yeah, I don't I don't think that I. Well, have no chance. Let's find out if our distrust is correctly placed or misplaced. Let's do it, Doug. What's our answer? Hey there, stackers. I'm Wild Kingdom lover and part-time geographic dart thrower, Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. Today, we're celebrating National Geographic by focusing on the origins of a hit show created in response to a National Geographic survey. Carmen San Diego. Heck, I remember Carmen San Diego back when she was just Carmen La Jolla. Ah, the good old days. Uh, Southern California kids, the only one who gets that joke. Our question was this. What percentage of people said in a National Geographic survey that they couldn't find either the Soviet Union or the specific ocean on a map? The answer? A full, whopping 25%, which means uh, You know what? I think we missed something. It was the, the survey asked them if they thought they could find it, but the survey didn't actually ask them to go find it. And I think Americans in general would be much more optimistic no. on their abilities than reality. <laughs> but either way, I win. The answer is one out of... Yeah, what are you bitching about? Seriously. <laughs> but I was still... How is this that I won and I was still wildly off? Oh, my yeah, I know, right? You guys yeah. need more faith in the world. You need more faith in, in our community and... 
the people that are one of those tricky questions. Alive, again. It's like you wouldn't ask the question if it wasn't a, an obviously you know high. End. But again, that's but think the, about that, that's Len. That's still that's one, one out of but every. Like they started a whole show for twenty five percent. Yeah, one I out know. of every four people is a big number. Like yeah. that is so, a big, big number. So apparently, seventy five percent of people could point to a specific ocean. <laughs> right. Yeah. At least one. Or at least, at find least one specific on ocean. It also means that one of us on this panel right now can't identify where this is going to That's because it's gone. <laughs> look to your left and look to your right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Can you identify both? Because there's a good chance person next to you can't. All right, the second half of this show is uh, brought to you by Magnify Money. Len Penzo, you know what happens when you come to stackybenjamins.com slash magnify money? Yeah, you get a, a complimentary subscription to National Geographic magazine. You do not. That oh. would be... And wetandsoggy.com. <laughs> you might get a free subscription to wetandsoggy.com. However, I will have to run that by their parent company, Lending Tree. That might end our relationship with Magnify Money. Hey, would you guys throw in a wetandsoggy.com subscription along with the Magnify Money? No? Hello? Hello? Yeah, it probably not. Like the domain's available. What's yeah. actually fine, Len, is that uh, out of all those brick-and-mortar products you use every day, turns out there's a lot of online banks out there, and over 92% of those banks rated head-to-head -head, uh, when it comes to savings accounts, checking accounts. High-yield savings is a big thing. If you're keeping an emergency fund in your checking account earning zero, you definitely need to go to Magnify Money and compare, because depending on where you are in the United States, there's different offers, some better than others, depending on where you are. Head to stackybenjamins.com slash money, and you'll see for yourself all this right it's gonna be a trivia question one day <laughs> what percentage of banks <laughs> yeah. it's like what was the trivia question len we did a couple of years ago where well, no that was just last year wasn't it? where og kept nailing the exact number like, that was pretty annoying he'd go first and just get the number i don't know I, that's bad memories i, I don't even want to i try to block yes. that stuff out of my mind I do, I do like a few years ago when we did the uh, the, the the ice uh, barrel jumping competition. That was that was a good one. Uh, but anyway, let's talk about this topic. Nick Majuli talking about chasing alpha, and he says that you shouldn't do it, which means. If he's right, Doc G, then we should be playing more defense with our portfolio. Isn't that what that means? Like, stop trying to chase these excess returns. Let's be a little more defensive. Well, again, I don't know philosophically if not changing, if not chasing excess returns is being defensive. So I think you can have a nice, fairly aggressive asset allocation, even if you're not looking for extra alpha right so this idea of trying to meet the market as opposed to beat the market there's some obvious easy ways to do that you can be aggressive in what percentage are equities and what percentage are non-equities uh, and yet still not spend time or in this case what nick is talking about wasting time trying to get that little excess alpha let's ask the other half of that question that paulette i guess that means you should be more offensive uh, or play more offense, not be more offensive. <laughs> I think those are, two be hard. those are two different things. You need to play more offense when it comes to making more money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's been a huge focus for me where it's like you can, you know, like you can only save so much, but how much you can earn, you know, that just goes so much Blue higher. Sky. Blue sky. Yeah. Yeah. What are some tactics you've used to earn more? Definitely partnering. I just had, I just got like my highest speaker fee ever and it was so much higher than I've ever gotten. And I was just like, oh, because I sold through someone else's channel and not just my own channel. So I think, you know, kind of audience sharing for people who are out there with their own brands, that's huge. And just getting, you know, getting those relationships that will level you up. Len, how about you? What are tactics you used at work? I mean, it's interesting asking Paulette as an entrepreneur that question, but for you that worked uh, a corporate career, what were strategies you used to make more? Well, uh, uh, do perform well. That that's one of the that's one of the best ways to do it. Perform as well as you can and be as valuable as you can to your company, and that will come back to you in terms of higher higher income every every. Uh, 
year. Yeah, I think I, just, I feel like I just read an article about this in the New York Times. <laughs> <laughs> who who would have written such an article? Who, it was brilliant. It was a brilliant article. So what did Daniel Pink say, Paulette? Well, according to Daniel Pink, you should focus on fairness and you should really do the work to think about where your boss is coming from and what it looks like for them and why it's good for them to um, to give you a raise. But I also think isn't it doesn't it seem like now more and more changing companies is really is really a great way to get big bumps to get big. Uh, it seems like it. I mean, that wasn't the focus of my article, but yeah, I, I definitely have seen a lot of people talk about that. Yeah, Len, you never played that game though. Uh, I did one time. Yes, I did. I did once in my career at the 10 year mark. I was getting uh, I, poor. I, I got a, a series of couple poor raises in a row um, and uh, I felt undervalued. And uh, so I, I switched companies uh, and then I finished up uh, with my for 25 years. But um, that can have that can backfire. I mean, you can do it, do it once, mm -hmm. do it twice. You do it much more than that. And people start looking at you with the jaundiced eye and like, well, if I hire this person, uh, are they going to stay around with me? Because, you know, it does cost money. There, there's a there's a, a you know, cost money to get a new employee on mm -hmm. and let them learn. And you don't want them to leave after a year. So uh, I do know uh, I had a colleague back when I was younger, he hopped jobs like three or four times uh, within about a 18 month period. Uh, he kept coming back to the company I was working with, then he would leave, get a, a 10, 20% bump, then he would leave that company, come back to our company. The, the fourth time that happened, the one, two, three, four, uh, he was the first one laid off. And uh, I don't think he ever got another job in our industry again, because it, he had just uh, he, he had a bad he had a stigma attached to him after that. So there is some loyalty that I think, uh, you know, you can't play that game too often. Yeah, Len's point is is well taken and I would say accurate for the vast majority of industries. But I have seen in two different times in the, the tech world, one of which is happening right now and the other happened kind of in the late 90s and early 2000s, where if you stuck around at a company too long, from a hiring standpoint, you looked stagnant because there was a high likelihood that you weren't being exposed to the newer technologies because companies latch on to specific technologies and they can't they can't move with them too often because you've got to build a platform to run your business or whatever you're selling on these technologies and you can't grab the next latest and greatest thing. But if you stay there as a technologist and that's the tech you know, it becomes really hard to get another job. So that was definitely true in the dot com boom and all of a lot of those foundational technologies were being created to fuel the, the dot-com boom. And then the other one's happening now with AI and machine learning. And if you stick around with the AI that your firm has chosen, uh, it's going to be hard to get another job without retraining yourself on your own. So other than, and, and there may be some other examples outside of that industry that I'm not thinking of. Maybe there's some in the medical arena, uh, Doc, that I'm not aware of. But um, so that's something to consider. But I think in most other industries, Len, I think you're right, uh, showing that longevity and that I'm going to stick with this and be loyal is pretty valuable. Doc G. So I obviously, as a physician, it's a little bit different than other professions, but there were a few ways I found to increase the cash flow long term. One was at the beginning of my career, I did the things that other people didn't want to do. So I worked in a big practice and they were all busy and they had all these overflow patients who needed to be seen and they didn't have space for. So I started by seeing other people's patients. I ended up actually <laughs> making more revenue and income than they did even in my first few years because I was willing to see the patients they didn't feel they had enough time for. The next was to leverage the skills I had. So as a physician, I had a certain set of skills and I found I could leverage them to have new income streams. So because I was a practicing doctor, I could be a medical director for a nursing home and I didn't have to learn anything new to actually perform that role. And that brought in extra revenue or I could work as a medical expert for the medical legal system. And pretty much just by nature of what I was doing for a living, it gave me that expertise and I could use that as a lot of side hustle income. And I guess the last thing that I really did as a doctor was innovation 
transition. So I went from working for someone else to owning my own practice to eventually realizing that there was a hole in the market. I had a bunch of elderly patients who couldn't get in to see the doctor and were willing to pay a premium to have the doctor come and see them. So I started what was called a concierge medical practice, but I also paired that with nursing homework. So I was doing something I had never seen anyone else do, but there were holes in the market that needed filling. So I think if you use a, a mix of those three types of things, you can really increase your income. And it allowed me to pretty much find X, I think what a normal doctor wow. was making doing what I was doing. Fabulous. Dang. And you are by no means normal. Yes, I, I've never been. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm incredibly good at trivia, in fact. That's one of those things that people can't quite figure out. <laughs> Ninja, after one week, he's already flexing. That's going to get bad. That might be a great place to leave it. Focus on focus on your income. Uh, Doc G, one more thing for you. If we get past this idea of hustle culture and just take this as f his continuum that he lists on this, Nick lists a continuum early on. Focus more on saving, and as Len said earlier, get the shovel out. Later on, focus on your asset allocation. You agree with that? Yes, I, I think that's very reasonable, and it goes along with front loading, which is something I'm always a big fan of. Is that's you make a lot of money when you're young, you don't necessarily have to as you get older. I think that's a great place to leave this. Let's find out what all of you are doing where you are. Uh, uh, Doc G, let's start with you. What's going on at Earn and Invest, my friend? We are chugging along and in fact coming out or came out last week when this goes live, we talked to our own Paulette Prahatch about her oh, yeah. powerhouse writers program. It's really, really exciting. I think all of us are fascinated by this idea of how we get our name in the byline, but not only that, but could you make a living doing it? It's an interesting question and I can't wait for people to hear our interview. I just think there's so much power in being a better writer and people, mm -hmm. it's funny, people think it's easy and then they sit down with a blank sheet of paper or a blank screen and they go, uh, I got nothing, you know, <laughs> far harder. But, you know, people are like, oh, all you do is sit around and write all day, Paulette, oh, big deal. That's, it's, it's, that's pretty difficult. Speaking of Paulette, Paulette, what's happening with you? We are starting Powerhouse Writers this Bam. week, and it's not too late to get in. Um, we've definitely had some people uh, hop in after the first week, and we do a little private session to catch you up. No big deal, but it's at powerhousewriters.com, and uh, you can email me, paulette at paulettperhatch.com, to uh, get more info and get in the last minute. Awesome. And you know what? We'll have a link, everybody, to not just Earn and Invest and Powerhouse Writers on our show notes at Stacky Benjamins, but also to whatever Len Penzo is doing. Dude, what's going on at LenPenzo.com? You know what? I feel miserable right now because if I had taken, you know, Paulette's Powerhouse Writers course, I wouldn't have to be promoting the article I'm going to promote right now at LenPenzo.com, <laughs> which is 36 amazing uses for plastic bags. So uh, that's uh, that's what I got over my boring website. Uh, and maybe <laughs> I'm going to be com. heading over to Paulette's pretty soon so I can learn how to be a much more interesting writer. Uh, there's nothing boring about any of that. That's so awesome. By the way, I have learned so much about writing from, uh, he used to give great sessions at FinCon, Len, about writing and about titles and yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I gave, uh, it was really popular. It was a, uh, it was a headline writing actually. I, I did, had a, had a, mm. a yeah, uh, I, seminar I there on headline writing. It was a pretty fun seminar. I think the, I think the charts are still on, uh, they're over there at the FinCon site actually. So uh, if you want to go check them out, it was a fun. I think you're I, selling I yourself fun. short. I think you're selling yourself short, Len, because when you just described that and you gave me the title, I thought, that is so benign that there's got to be something really good in it. <laughs> like right. he's, it's just so freakishly boring. Plastic bags. I bet you there's some good stuff yeah. in there. Well, I'm you know what the I'm you read. know what the key is, Doug. If you combine the plastic bags with the stuff you find at wetandsoggy.com. <laughs> <laughs> It was it was actually thirty five things you could do with plastic bags, but he discovered a thirty sixth when the roof started leaking. And now, if you look really closely behind him, you can see the plastic bags hanging down from the roof. <laughs> Len, don't drown in the bunker, please don't drown. <laughs> <laughs> all right, everybody, that's it for us. By the way, we we've said a thank you to all the stackers before for uh, helping us out um, and for being such a great family. But you know what? We haven't done it with you guys here. We were um, we were just honored by Bankrate.com, one of the biggest uh, personal finance sites as awesome. 
podcast of the year and it's because of the work you guys oh, did so yes thank you for all the help you guys have done that was that was a big surprise for us just fantastic so thank you so much you know what, what's funny guys is that in the in the social post that announced that we'd won that there wasn't any mention of doc g there wasn't any mention of len or Oh, God, look at look at the time. This show's about over. Time to, hey, Doug, what should we have learned today? Well, Joe, here's what we should have learned today. You're an ungrateful. No, I'm kidding. First, take some advice from our panel. How do you focus on making more focus first on where your biggest win will be and work backwards? Second, take it from the doc with the stock. Good financial plans aren't reactionary, so make a plan early, invest in aggressive mutual funds, and stick to it. Do that, and you won't have to worry about trying to outperform the market. But the big lesson? National Geographic should really be doing stories on the strange culture of the basement. Seriously, the only culture we have down here is that black mold growing up the wall next to the deep freeze. Thanks to Doc G for being with us. You can hear more from Doc on the Earn and Invest podcast. We'll also include links in our show notes at stackingbenjamins.com. Thanks to Len Penzo for joining us today. You can find Len at lenpenzo.com slash soggy pants. <laughs> Len, you just showed us behind you in the bunker. There's a big hole in your ceiling. Yes, that's uh, that is that's what happens when uh, the bunker has springs a leak, and then the water collects on the ceiling, and it gets so heavy that it collapses the ceiling. <laughs> that's incredible. So, so, yeah, that's uh, that's the result of. Uh, about eight out of 10 days of almost nonstop rain here in Southern California. Yep. And Did a Len, <laughs> Len, since it's the bunker, you should just be able to patch it with gold bars, which you have in excess sitting and in the bunker. So you're right, doc. And you know what? And, and since gold doesn't rust, that, that would be absolutely fine. You're absolutely right. That would work. <laughs> Just in time for my retirement, was... right? I mean, just in time for retirement. Yeah. Oh, of course. course. Nice big expense. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> Unexpected expenses in retirement? What are you talking about? Yeah, that never happened. Amazing. <laughs> and there is no more fun way to spend money on your house than oh, yeah. the roof. Well, and, right, and, and to compound Forget and to about compound the family it, vacation. To compound the problem, obviously, Southern California, I mean, I'm not the only house in Southern California with this problem. So we call the roofer mm -hmm. and, and it's, uh, you know, he's out, he's backlogged for probably a month before oh, I can oh, get, even oh. get somebody to <laughs> repair this. <laughs> what do you got then? The big blue attractive the uh, redneck tarp across here? <laughs> yes. yes. Well, he hasn't even come out to assess it yet. So, I mean, that's how that's how backed up he is. So, I, I, I don't know. Right now, we've got buckets. Lots and lots of if, buckets. If, if I'm the guy with a tarp company in New Jersey, I am putting all of my shipments to California right now. Oh, I'm telling you, I bring on the drought. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm ready for another, another Which is, uh, cannot long be drought. satisfied. <laughs> California just need more, more, more. Bring we on fire water. season. We don't want water. <laughs> Which between, is well between done, Between wildfires and, and, and floods, it's just, yeah, uh, yeah there's... We it's want fire. Totally. We don't want fire. When I was, when Cheryl and I were, were out at uh, Len and the Honeybees uh, uh, compound, you showed us pictures of the exact opposite, Doug, to your point. Uh, and it was these massive forest, forest fires right behind your neighbor's house because it was so dry. Yeah. Yeah. So now we get now we get to, you know, that's the, the seasons of Southern California, right? Fire, flood, earthquake and uh, drought. So. Yeah. Well, it just reminds you, the fact is that the recession is not affecting the trade workers, right? Because I can't get anyone in to fix any of the stuff going wrong in my house. So, like, yeah. it is a weeks or months long wait. People don't return your calls, et cetera. So yeah. lots of people are feeling the recession now. But if you are a plumber or electrician or apparently a roofer, uh, you are hot and in demand. Oh, the ghosting well, from trades people is a real hot. thing. 
(laughs) (laughs) Contrary to the calendars that your wife are buying, Doc, (laughs) they're not all hot. Yeah, we're still getting ghosted, according to Joe. (laughs) Yeah, the 12-month butt crack, plumber butt crack uh, calendar. (laughs) I would die to see a butt crack right now. Actually, a roof of a butt crack. (laughs) What? That's the clip right there, Joe. That is the clip. Guys, this this has been more entertaining than 50 feral hogs on a trampoline. <laughs> <laughs> but just barely. Just barely. <laughs>